morning, everyone, and congrats that you make it through a whole week of Amsterdam <coughs> and are here on Friday in person to this talk. So, hi, I'm Giovanni Liva. I'm, oh, sorry. I am a TC member of uh, the uh, Captain Project. Here I'm um, with Brad. Unfortunately, Anne and Hea didn't make it to KubeCon, but luckily we have here Brad with us to accompany me to this talk. Hi, everyone. My name's Brad. Um, I'm from New Zealand, living in Australia at the moment. I first started uh, contributing to Captain about two years ago. So that was with the V1, which we'll talk about the differences between you know the V1 and the lifecycle life cycle talk at soon. Um, I originally wanted Captain, I was using Argo, and I wanted to extend the capability of it with event-driven CI CD. So I started um, adopting it. I had changes that I wanted to make, and then I realized how easy it was to actually you know, make, do a PR for the project. So that's what sort of kept me going, and then I worked my way up to a maintainer of the project as well. Um, and now on the technical steering committee also. So um, has anyone here used Captain? Any hands? Obviously, Thomas as well. Yeah, he doesn't count. Um, OK, so it could be a little bit confusing, but we have two versions. So the first version was done on cloud events. Um, what we realized with that was it wasn't really proper cloud native. So over the years, we decided that if we want to pay back a little bit of tech debt, we decided to make the lifecycle uh, toolkit as the cloud native world was you know, going crazy and we wanted to be more um, Kubernetes native of, of how we talk to it. So therefore, we started the, the lifecycle toolkit. So maybe you can speak a bit about what are the new features of this lifecycle toolkit and how it differs from V1. So V1, uh, we created four years ago. And the main problem back in the days in the cloud native names in the uh, cloud native space was, oh, look, a new tool that I want to integrate in my pipeline and use it. So we were mainly an orchestrator around tools that you can use to solve your specific use case. But we noticed that nowadays, uh, everyone moved into Kubernetes, wants to be more cloud native, and we were not there yet to support people deploying their application to a Kubernetes cluster. So <clears throat> what we did is six months ago, we rebranded the project and we start again. And now what we try to solve is make sure that you can deploy your application in a Kubernetes cluster in the best way possible. So high level speaking here, you can see that eventually you have some manifest that will hit your Kubernetes cluster. This can be from a kubectl apply, can be from an Argo sync or a Flux, some, or a Helm install. Somehow manifest will reach your Kubernetes cluster. From there, we can intercept all of this manifest and try to create an application concept around your or the manifest that you deploy. Because right now, you have singular workloads that um, you should be bundled together in order to create an application. And we can read all the manifest, detect how your application should look like, and we can run some pre and post check of your deployment. I will go more in the detail with also a demo later to explain more. Oh, I forgot, I already have the demo, damn it. <laughs> uh, damn it. How can I keep this while demoing? Uh, so. Let me do some cleanup. So how it looks like. So <clears throat> you have several manifests. The only thing that you need to do to enable the lifecycle toolkit after you install it in your Kubernetes cluster is to enable it through an annotation on your namespace. This way, yes? Thank you. Let me start the demo so we can see. Okay, so the first thing is, is it good enough now? Yeah. Perfect. Is enabling your namespace to be watched and allow the lifecycle toolkit to operate on this namespace and support the deployment of your application. 
Ben? Now? Oh, damn it. <laughs> I'm good at this. Um, <laughs> so the only thing that we require you to work with this um, is to provide uh, standardized labels or annotation of Kubernetes. You should provide the app Kubernetes IO name, part of, and version. With part of, we can watch all the manifests that have been applied to your cluster, group them by part of, so we can detect how your application should look like. And this is enough to provide you observability about what's happening inside your cluster, because we can watch everything and monitor and expose traces and metrics via open telemetry. <clears throat> I can show you. And if you want to do something more fancy, like I was saying before, to run something before or after the deployment, you can add also some extra notation on your manifest in the deployment manifest or any workload level to run something before pre-deployment test uh, task, sorry, or after with a post-deployment task. And you specify what type of deployment uh, task you want to run. And <clears throat> in this case, I want to run before my application starts to be deployed to check if a service called front-end is there or not. How does this task look like? You can see in the manifest that we have um, CRD here because we try to be more GitOps friendly so you can deploy this configuration next to your application. The captain task definition defines how the task, what the task should do. In this case, it's a simple Dino function, so JavaScript basically, and you can either have it in line here just for demo purposes or you can also download this artifact directly from an artifactory. Um, and you can see here, we do nothing else than check an external URL and wait if we can ping it or not. An example for this could be, for instance, that you have an application made by front-end, back-end, and the database, and database and Kubernetes are hard, so you decide to have an external service that runs the database for you. But <clears throat> if you have some network policies that prevent any outbound traffic from your cluster, if you try to deploy the application, your back-end service will continuously crash loop because it cannot reach the database. So what you want to do, maybe, is to run a task before the deployment starts that check if you can reach this database. If everything is fine, then the deployment can progress. And what do I mean with the deployment stops? If we look into an example that I have it here, you can see that <coughs> the four services that of this demo are still in pending state. Why this? Because we hook into the scheduler to prevent any pod to be bound to a node if the pre-checks are not satisfied. This way, we can block any workload to be scheduled to a node. We block any container to run. This way, if something is wrong, like this uh, database example that I did, we'll not um, allow any deployment, so we'll not create any noise, any error in your cluster that your monitor solution that will scream at you to, that you need to fix it. Um, and with all of this, we also monitor everything in your application because now we sit in front of the cube API so we can see why it's not centered. Yes, um, we can monitor everything that is happening in your deployment. So we can provide you with Dora metrics and traces about what's happening behind the scene when you try to deploy an application. For instance, in this demo, you can see that we managed to run uh, nine deployments. Three are successful, six are failing. The time between the different deployments is three minutes and 75, 77 seconds. You can also see the different version, how long it took it to deploy. And you can see here, this is the example that I run. And we can also therefore provide you with a trace that shows why this deployment failed. And this is all open telemetry. So you just need to plug in the collector URL, the open telemetry collector, and we can push all this telemetry data to the collector. And then you can send it to Grafana, Dynatrace, Datadog, you name it, the platform of choice that you want. And the cool thing is whenever you have a more complex deployment, such this one is the example that works full-fledged, um, 
you can then trace your application deployment across stages, because maybe you start in dev, then you promote it to production, but then in production, you find there was an error, and you can drill down back, looking at the traces, why I didn't catch the issue in production also in dev, and prevent some error to happening. So you can then have a full trace across different stages and figure out what went wrong. Um, other things that we do is also have evaluations. Since Captain V1, the main usage of it was quality gate, which means um, I want to test the quality for my application. The lifecycle toolkit allows you also to run something after the deployment went through, because all the pre-checks were okay, so the deployment started, the scheduler allocate some nodes to the pods. Then I want to run something, such as a load test, and then verify if the response type of my application is in a threshold that I'm considered acceptable. And for that, we have here um, a captain evaluation definition that you can ship next to your application. And here you can see a separation of concerns between where, what metric I want to look at for my application and what target do I want for my metric. In this case, I want that uh, when I deploy, the available CPUs should be greater than one. This is a stupid demo example, but you can have more fancy one for your real use case. And here the separation of concern is very important because one thing is what target do I want for my metric? And the other thing is where I do get this data from. And here you can see that the metric is coming from a different CRD, Captain Metric, where we can say that this data is fetched from Prometheus and the query looks like this. And if tomorrow you switch from Prometheus to Dynatrace, Datadog, New Relic, you simply change the provider without changing the rest of the code. So you can have an abstraction between where the data is fetched and what do you need to do with this data. Also here you can see that we have a parameter called fetch interval seconds, because what we do is <clears throat> try to bring observability directly into your cluster. So far, you have your monitor solution that monitor your application and your cluster and send this telemetry data outside somewhere else. And then you always need to go through a different API to read metrics that you might want to have it next to your cluster to use it for scaling, for instance. So what we did is to create a captain metric server, which um, <clears throat> what it does is simply every 10 seconds in this example, let's go to Prometheus, query for that value, read the result, translate that into Kubernetes native metric language. So we extend the uh, Kubernetes metric server and we expose all the metrics that you want natively into the metric server of your cluster. This way you can configure HPA, horizontal pod auto scaler, uh, KEDA or Argo rollout to do progressive rollout or flutter with flux to use directly uh, Kubernetes native metrics. So you don't need to query an external tool for doing this. And yeah, I think this cover a bit the demo part. Um, so, so far is a bit about the metric server, how it works. You can see here that <clears throat> we have a metric adapter that any tool can hook into that. And most importantly, we have several observability platform that we support. Dynatrace, of course, Prometheus, and Datadoc, but you see there are three dots because we are looking for maintainers and contributors. And contributors. So please, <clears throat> uh, we have a country press later today at 2 p.m. should it be. So join if you want to add your observability tool to the list. It's straightforward and we are there to support you. Uh, something that you want to say, Brad, about this or? Yeah, so um, we have working group meetings on EU and US time zones as well. So it matches the time zones pretty much around the world if anyone wants to come. Um, it, it's a really good community to get involved with. There's, we have good first issues all the way to you know, more harder tasks to work on. And you can find, are we going to use the CNCF Slack or the, the captain? Yeah, both are fine. Bo both are fine. Yeah. Okay, so we have a... If you go to captain.sh, you can see um, the Slack channel, and then we're also in the CNCF Slack if you don't want too many Slacks. Um, 
I, I guess because most people knew we could sort of start some questions and get some flow going there. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions so far? I mean, we did go over it a little bit fast with the manifest, so if you do need us to slow down and explain it more, we're happy to do that as well in terms of the providers. Yeah. I'm just curious how we, um, you showed in the, I think the, in the first part uh, of the presentation how we, uh, you keep the pod spending. Uh, I was more curious how is how is it exactly implemented? How do you like actually tell the scheduler? Yeah, uh, I didn't went much into the technical details, but we have a booth. If you want to chat also afterwards after the talk, feel free to reach out to the booth. Uh, how we do that? We simply create a scheduler plugin. <clears throat> So we can, the basically, how Kubernetes work is whenever it tries to allocate a node to a pod, before it calls the plugin, which is us, and we said, wait, we need to wait for the pre-checks to finish. And then when they're finished, we can say, sorry, the scheduler should not go on because there were some problems. Or yes, now please, Kubernetes scheduler, work on that. So we can work with any scheduler. If you have your custom scheduler, we still work with that. But since um, this last release of Kubernetes, um, now the release scheduler, scheduling gates are beta, and we plan to support this API to block any pod to be scheduled. So we don't need to use any more the scheduler plugin. Yeah, You're welcome. There's quite a few changes to the scheduler in the next two releases as well. So um, some really good, if you look at the enhancements of Kubernetes, you can see all the, the changes that they're doing. They're quite, it's gonna make this uh, very cool. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yep, you can shout, I can repeat it for uh, the stream. I'll, I'll go, it's okay. Thank you. What use cases would you use this for? Oh, thanks. Yeah, so as use cases, we have observability of your application, or better say, the deployment of your application to see what's happening behind the scene when you send some manifest. Uh, then prevent bad things to occur. Um, if you have automations that automatically deploys your application, your cluster, let's say every time you merge a PR in main, an automation kicks in and <clears throat> tries to create manifest and Argo picks up the changes and tries to deploy in your cluster, but uh, someone is merging a PR while you have a maintenance window for your cluster. Does it make sense to deploy the new application when you know that half of the nodes are unhealthy most likely will crash loop? and create a lot of noise and then create some ticket for some engineer to look into what's the problem. No, but the way of doing that is to run something that could prevent the deployment with a simple check such as page, look into pager duty, there is any open issue, is I'm uh, in a maintenance mode? If yes or no, then you can decide to progress with the deployment or stop it. The second one is to support this uh, quality gate part where you can run also things after the deployment so you can m check the quality of your application because readiness and health props just say if a workload is fine, but not if the application is healthy. So with this, since we know when the application, all the workloads of the, your application are completed, you can run some tests to check the quality of your application. And only if everything is fine, you can maybe promote it automatically to the next stage. So these are mainly the use cases that we are trying to solve. Hi, thank you. Uh, I, would, uh, I would like to ask about uh, how it looks like from the uh, CI side. So, for example, when uh, some people deploy it and uh, they don't uh, do it uh, themselves, and uh, what uh, can be seen in logs, for example, how uh, people understand that they need to go to the uh, Grafana or uh, trace, uh, look the trace and so on. So maybe something happened and CI job failed or uh, write something on the, maybe it's demo time, <laughs> uh, we'll be, we will show, but thank you. Okay, so if I get your question correctly is, so where can you see if something is failing? I, I think um, maybe if you show the roadmap, the, the roadmap will have a lot of these answers to the question as well. So um, do you have the roadmap up there? Yes. It's also here, if you want to look at it, it's public. 
It's a GitHub project on our uh, organization, Captain Org. And ooh, this is big. So really your question was to see that when it's failing, what are you going to do afterwards sort of thing? Like, are you going to alert self-remediation? Okay, see how after you apply your manifest, if something goes wrong, how the, can the developers go to the Grafana website and see what's happening? Uh, that's a very tough question because most of the time you have automation that, that trigger everything because you don't want to allow anyone to access your production cluster. You want only a single you know, automation that can read and send the manifest to that in order to prevent you know, bad things or typos, error, human errors there. Um, and everything is event-based, so you cannot really uh, apply some manifest and then wait for the result and get an error code. Uh, a better solution for that is to observe the event stream of Kubernetes, because every time something is happening, Kubernetes emits some events. And we also do that. You can see in the trace, so whenever you start a deployment, a new Nice, a new trace uh, is created. So let me do another example. And you can watch for that trace to see what's happening. So you know that this is your website. You simply have to wait. You see the trace started. You can then look at the trace and wait until the different things are completed and this trace will be populated with all the information that you need. Or you can watch the Kubernetes event stream and we also emit Kubernetes event whenever something is happening or failing. So in the example of before that the database cannot be reached because of network policy, we create an event, an error event saying you cannot uh, satisfy this task. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> Any further question from the audience? Okay, so maybe we can go over to the roadmap. As you can see, we start to work on <coughs> the, the, thanks for the question before, the readiness scheduling gates. Uh, we are looking into using them, but we will not support them until they are stable but we are preparing for that. Um, they'll be stable in, uh, in two releases from now. It'll be stable. Um, then what we are trying also to work on is automatic application discovery. If you forget one of those recommended labels, we might still be able to detect your application automatically, or we try to create an approximation of your application just to make it easier for you to use our tool. Then on the context propagation for GitOps, this is a cool thing when you promote through GitOps, <clears throat> uh, you lose uh, track about uh, the previous PR that um, created the things in dev. Then when everything is completed, someone create a PR for the staging environment and eventually for the production environment. But these PRs are not linked together. We want to solve this issue propagating a trace context across stages. So simplify the propagation of the trace ID 
through different contexts and stages, so you can trace everything back to dev. Uh, then, uh, since we rebranded the project six months ago, we know our documentation are not the best, <laughs> so we are working hardly on making it better. But we plan also multiple things, such as introduce the concept of instance, because now you have maybe the production environment, but you don't run a single instance of your production environment. You have one in uh, Frankfurt, European Center, one in North America, one in Singapore. So we want to have the concept of instance also for you. And then uh, propagate context information for running uh, this piece of code for hook your own tool with the captain task to propagate further context information. So you can have more information about what's happening in your deployment inside your task. So you can make a smarter decision on what you should do. And yeah, more uh, support for different type of um, uh, runtime to run your tasks. Because right now we support Dino, but we plan to support also Python and most importantly containers. So you can bundle everything into an image a simple container and then we can you know simply run your container so you don't need to type script or script your way through but we have a lot of things in the backlog and if you have any opinion any idea any suggestion please reach out and comment because we are really looking forward to have the community to support on our decision how we should do the GitOps propagation of the trace context because every organization has their own way of doing promotion and we would like to have the feedback from the community in order to create the best solution. Yeah? So regardless of promotions, you don't approve of the uh, No, uh, because uh, promotion is a bit of a controversial topic. There is no one size fits all. Every organization does that differently. Someone go through open a Jira ticket. Someone wants to have everything automated. Uh, we don't have any opinion at the moment, but uh, it would be interesting if we can have a chit chat about how you do your promotion. Yeah, I've worked lots of promotion on the V1 as well, so I'd be interested, and I know Thomas would as well. It's a, it's quite a complex thing, especially if you try to put rollback in as well. Yeah, it's we've spent many weeks of pain on that topic. <laughs> okay, well, thank you everyone for coming and. Yeah, if you have any questions or want to reach out, please. Um, and you know, your use cases on alerting, we can we can help you with that as well. And we're here to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.